Hello, everybody. My name is Ian Taylor, and welcome to the Marvel Card Collectors podcast, brought to you by the Marvel Cards Fan Collective, an awesome community of card collectors and creators. You can find our two groups on Facebook, details of which are at the end of this podcast, so come check us out. With me is my co-pilot in all things Marvel Cards. In 2019, a high-end character collector was sentenced for a podcast for a crime he didn't commit. This man promptly became one of the most respected voices in the card hobby, despite operating under a pseudonym. Today, still wanted by the other Silver Surfer collectors, he survives as a card hunter for hire. If you need a card, if no one else can help, and if you can find him, maybe you can hire Norin Rad, the card whisperer. Man, that's awesome. <laughs> Oh, gosh. I'm going to have to start doing these for you. This is just, I just get complimented all the time. This is amazing. I love it. I was like, I was like, the A team came into my head this morning and I was like, you so know what? Good. I'm going to rip off the intro to the A team. And I, I was like, how do I make it, it work? And I just I about it. managed it. Anyway, yeah. oh, speaking of, um, in a rather, rather loose kind of segue fashion, speaking of teams and, and four men who, who made an indelible mark on, on Marvel masterpieces and certainly the hobby, uh, with us today as our guest, I'm, I'm tickled pink, quite frankly. I'm freaking um, out. I can't I, believe. I mean, it's so cool. <laughs> I'll <laughs> behave. I'm better. I'm calming down. I'm good. 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 Calm. Um, with us today is Peter Scanlon. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much. Glad ah, to be here. no problem at all. Um, we, we were just we were just talking before um, we started recording. And you have a rather fine plague beard going on, which 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 <laughs> struck me as that could be your pirate name. <laughs> plague. <laughs> it's a lot whiter than it was last time I grew one. But uh, when I grew one originally back in my, I don't know, 20s or something like that, my wife said I looked like a 40-year-old psychologist, which back then was a bad thing. But now, looking like a 40-year-old <laughs> psychologist would be a good thing. So <laughs> nope. it's not really working. It's a fine look. It isn't, it isn't, I know exactly what you mean. Every time this grows out a bit more, it's whiter and whiter. I can't, I can't be doing with it. No one, on the other hand, is just blessed. You know, I shaved an hour ago. So, I'm, you know, <laughs> no, um, actually, I look really young without my beard. It's, it's pretty crazy to get any kind of credibility. I have to grow a beard. So, <laughs> I I have to keep the facial hair. At least you, at least you can grow one. Um, so, uh, you thank you, Peter. This is, um, this is this is a, a rare and kind of sudden honor because we we happened to use your intro on last week's episode, and I dropped you a note to say you know we yep. were using it, and then we it was all of a sudden we were like oh do you want to come on the podcast yeah sure <laughs> you're free on Sunday, and uh, <laughs> if it was if it was that easy to get a date I'd have been married years ago, um, <laughs> so um, I, 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 there's so many things I, I can kind of ask you, um, and obviously for those who 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 are listening who don't know quite frankly. What, you need to you need to go and, and get some Marvel knowledge up in here. You're one of the four artists who did Marvel Masterpieces 1995, mm -hmm. um, and I know you also did um, a lot of pieces for uh, Fleer Ultra X Men. I think you did some X Force cards for that one. Mm -hmm. Yep, I did. And also, so I'm telling you stuff you don't know, but our listeners <laughs> might not. And, uh, and also, uh, Fleer Ultra. Yes, yeah, like, I forgot. Did I do those? I don't. Know. <laughs> uh, Was that me? Yeah. Uh, and Fleer Ultra Spider-Man, I do believe there was a Masterpieces insert set that had a number of yours yep. as well. So um, I, I guess I, I know very little about you. I mean, I've looked on your website, um, um, but but kind of how did you know, tell us about how you kind of got started and what led up to you getting into the Marvel work back in the 90s? Right. Well, as a kid, I mean, I grew up in the 70s and I was a huge comic book fan. So I really from, say, like 1971 till 78, pretty much. I was a rabid collector. I mean, comics for my life, pretty much. I just recently actually during this whole plague situation uh, found my childhood comic collection, which is fantastic. I mean, like bagging them and they're really good shape. I thought they were lost and they're they're not. But anyway, mm. so I was a huge fan of, of that. Um, and then when I went to art school in the 80s, um, I was you know less so I, I really wasn't that. Uh, I didn't really like what was happening in comics at that time, although looking back at it, there were a lot of great comics I totally missed, like, you know, like like Frank Miller's Daredevil or you know, all kinds of huge things that I missed. So I'm going back and, and buying those now where I can. But um, after art school, I just became um, an illustrator. So I was doing tons of illustration, a lot of illustration that wasn't, you know, totally what I would do normally, like stuff for well, anything just to pay my bills, you know, just uh, editorial yeah. illustration for electronics companies or anything. But also I did a lot of book covers, I did a lot of fantasy and science fiction. That was the fun stuff. 
So if, uh, you know, a good month, I'd be working on maybe a book cover or two for, you know, something science fiction -y or, or fantastical. Um, and also in the early 90s, like maybe like 1990, give or take, um, I got back into comics more because a good friend of mine who was who never kind of left the whole comic world. Uh, he told me that there was some really great stuff happening, you know, a lot like uh, Jim Lee, for instance, had just entered or, or just uh, I've just entered. But my friend just noticed that he just entered. And so, you know, went back and bought back issues of X-Men with Jim Lee doing it and everything. Um, and that was just yeah, not just Jim Lee, obviously, but all the people who, would, you know, like Tom McFarlane and you know, all the people who you'd think of who played yeah. the image. Um, so I got back into it and then just, it was very synchronicitous. It wasn't even like, I mean, I did, I did try, I did get into Marvel to see John Romita with my, more of my childhood heroes. Um, and we, it's kind of a, a horrible story because he was totally my childhood hero. One of my main childhood heroes, along with like, you know, Jack Kirby and others, you know, Gil Kane, other people like that. Yeah. And when I got in to see him, we kind of got off on the wrong foot because Earl Norem, who's a very famous like a uh, Conan cover artist and really good painter. I, I had met him someplace. I showed him some paintings and he was really a nice, really nice, uh, you know, older gentleman at the time. And he gave me John Romita's number because they were good old friends. And somehow John Romita, I, maybe I misrepresented myself. I don't really have that much chutzpah, so I probably should have misrepresented myself, but I think I was pretty honest about it. Just that, Oh, you know, Earl Norham, I ran into him and he gave me your number. But somehow John Romita thought that I was like good friends with Earl Norham or something. Oh. So in the course of our interview, it, it kind of rather than it be about my paintings, it became about like how well I knew Earl Norham and whatever. Anyway, oh. so it wasn't it. So anyway, so that was kind of like I felt I would kind of blown my big shot with Marvel because my childhood hero, it wasn't like ugly, like he didn't throw me out of the office or anything. But it just, you know, it just was a little more sour than I'd hoped it would be. Mm -hmm. Um Plus, if I hadn't lost my comic book collection, I could have probably, you know, regaled him with how much I loved his work more with more specifics, which would have probably been a good move. I would do that now because I'm older and wiser. But, <laughs> but then I was a young punk. I had no idea. So anyway, so then just through the normal illustration channels, like back in those days, you'd buy ads in promotional books. So, you know, you'd scrape together, you know, it was expensive, like $1,000 or $1,500, which, you know, very expensive then, especially expensive now, but for then especially. Um, and based on that, you have these cards from these promotional books that you leave behind at different companies. You know, you draw, I live in New Jersey, so I drop them off in New York, the different publishing houses and whatnot. Um, and that's kind of how you'd get your name around back then before there was an internet uh, or much of an internet to speak of. And so I got a call out of the blue in 1994 to do a single uh, Fleer Ultra X-Men card. So uh, X-Men card. And it was a uh, wild side who's a character who I hadn't even heard of. I don't think he's a very you know relatively peripheral character. But when they sent me the information, like all the reference, you know, different uh, appearances in comics and stuff, it was very much simpatico with the kind of thing I like to do. Like just sort of the 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 way he was kind of like crazy and, and dynamic and dramatic was something I could really imagine doing a, a painting of that, that I would like. So I really, really put everything else aside. Like I did my other jobs that I had to do, but I worked extra, extra, extra hard on this one. Like I really tried to like hit it out of the, out of the park as best I could. And it came out really good. Like it was really, you know, I, th I thought it was a really good job. I'm very proud of it. And I turned it in and, you know, didn't hear anything for, you know, they said, thank you. And then maybe it was relatively quickly, like a week later, maybe something like that, maybe something like that. Um, they called me back and they said, would you like to do nine cards? And I think that was uh, the entire X-Force team. And that wow. was good. That, yeah, and that was for uh, 1995 Fleer, Fleer Ultra X-Men. And I was then I was too, super excited. I was I was like, you know, nine times more excited than I was. To see the <laughs> I'm so happy. And I just moved into a new house uh, with my my wife. We just got married. Um, and she actually had to go. She went to England, actually, to to work for, for a year. So I was totally alone, which was actually kind of nice, which is me and my wife's cat living in this house. And I spent all summer working on those cards. And I, again, I really I gave it as much time as I possibly could. Like I really, really, you know, uh, just just work day and night, just constantly, constantly, constantly. And some of them I work too much on. Like I look at them now, and sometimes I would, like in some background detail, I put like it would have been better. You know, less is more. Would have been better if I didn't put. So much. <laughs> <laughs> I was so excited. I was like, it's a pile of rubble. I'm just gonna render every pipe, every like stone, every bit of gravel. So I did that, and that came out. I thought they came out pretty well for the most part. 
Um, and yeah, they're, they're, in. <laughs> they're amazing. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. And I noticed I had a little more time on too, because, you know, I had nine, but I had a longer period of time. So, it, you know, I could spend a little more time on them. And then I turned those in. And then pretty shortly after they turned around and they said, would you like to do, I don't know, 50 or whatever, <laughs> whatever Marvel masterpieces is. <laughs> so I went from one to nine to 50 or whatever, or something like that. And I, obviously I said, yeah, I, I would love to. And uh, yeah. And, and then I just spent the next, pretty much a year, I guess it was, doing those. And that was a much more, um, you know, uh, the time scale was, it just, they had to be done quicker, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, so I think a lot of them came out great. Some of them um, I look at now and they make me like, just want to cry because <laughs> I wish I could do them again. Because, you know, I just didn't have the, you know, no excuses that, you know, but, uh, you know, some of them I, I just, what are you going to do? You know what I mean? They, they had to go out the door and. You see, but like for us, they're just iconic. You know what I mean? It's it's not about. I mean, the the work is just brilliant, especially your style, right? Every you know, you know when you see that card, who who, who which you you did it. You know what I mean? Every time I've seen one of your cards, even if I'm not familiar with the set, I know you did it without a doubt. And that to me is just magical. You know, that's just it, it, in the detail and the level of attention to it. Plus, also. There's an attitude to each one of your Marvel cards and looking at your page and looking at the art you're doing now and everything. It's just, I mean, there's so much character to every detail for me. And it's just, just a great way to define you as like one of the four horsemen of Marvel masterpieces, right? You are, you are literally one of the big, big dogs to us. This is just amazing work. Just amazing work. We appreciate the time you put into it. It's just really cool. Thank you really. very much. Appreciate that. I really do. Really yeah, I think it's also it's one of those kind of artist things where basically um, and I talk to friends of mine about this who are artists and, you know, where the stuff that you fixate on is not necessarily bearing any connection to the things that people even see, you know, you know? so which is yeah. not really a healthy mindset. It's kind of a, a perverse, you know, peripheral <laughs> concern mindset. But, you know, what are you, you going to do? Well, it's weird, too, because for us, like. Like I grew up on them, you know, I, I when I saw these, I was a little bit younger and I was getting into Marvel cards and I didn't have a lot of money and all this other stuff. So I would see people trade them. And I, I've always I've, I come from a creative background, so I've always been more connected to art pieces and all these other types of things. But man, when I look back on it, not am I only seeing great art, but I'm also seeing a great memory. And that I think just adds so much to the piece that it, it just and like i said it makes it iconic right like uh the venom one you have where he's coming out of the cityscape right and you have the buildings that are down there sorry where you have the buildings and he's kind of coming out that is just such a presence right like you i mean you see that on a small car and you think you know you're like wow that's crazy i can only imagine what the original must look like you know to see these pieces and so forth a lot yeah. of windows in that one. <laughs> I'm sure. Well, I was just looking at it funny enough. I was like, that is a lot of windows. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> You've got the fans on the buildings. You have your name written on the top of the building. I mean, it's really, it's fantastic, though. But that adds to the presence of the piece. And then the green was brilliant because it has, like, this gassy kind of, like, dark, ominous feel to it. I thought that was pretty fun. Well, thank you. Thanks a yeah. lot. Yeah, you see a similar thing on, the, there's a, there's a Spider-Man one that was, um, I think it was Flew Ultra Spider Man, where there's the the background on it is brilliant. But the the Venom one I I I particularly like, um, and I'm not sure what set this is from because it's come up without the kind of bordering that they put on the cards. Um, so it's just a, a picture of the original painting, which is a, a shot of a headshot of Venom, where just the 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 symbiote mask is, is and you can see the human eye underneath. Yes, I, I absolutely love that. I mean, you know, I've never seen anyone else do that with Venom. Uh, do, do you, I mean, do you remember actually? I mean, obviously, you you put out fifty pieces over the space of a year, so I mean, you know, we can do them. You know, that's pretty much a week for each, and they're they're pretty, they're full color, they're pretty detailed pieces, and I'm sure you were ragged by the, by the end of the process. <laughs> um, at least you had three other guys doing fifty pieces each, so it wasn't all on you, <laughs> unlike um, uh, Joe Gisco or uh, Simone Bianchi um, or Bianchi, as we now know, is is Bianchi. Is yes, we've yeah. been butchering that, unfortunately. Yeah, we, <laughs> <laughs> for, for, for only 46 episodes um but um do you do you kind of remember do, does it all kind of blur into into one or do you actually 
specifically remember each of them or are some of them more de- more defined than others in your memory or yeah i mean I definitely remember them all to some degree and some are definitely much more you know stand out much more in memory than the other ones um that venom one does stand out quite a bit um because i like that one too and also i think often a lot of um what's that movie is it uh bangkok millionaire or what is it the one, or no what's the one with um you know the the kid who he wins the lottery. And oh, Slum uh, Dog. Slum Dog. Slum Dog. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of butchering titles, but yeah, but I think of that movie. <laughs> I think of that movie occasionally because the idea of that movie being being that sort of like everything in that young man's life uh, suddenly, like in this one moment, kind of comes to fruition and he can use everything. All these seemingly, you know, not very important experiences. Um, and since I was an illustrator before I did this for you know, not a great number of years, but maybe I don't know, eight or nine years, something like that. I started pretty early doing it. I'd done so many crappy illustrations of things <laughs> that, you know, like I get someone saying like, you know, do me, I don't even know, like a guy sitting in, a, in an armchair and, and the speakers are on both sides of him and there's a hole in the ceiling because the speakers blew. Him. Like I used to do this thing every Thursday for a while just to pay my bills where they would call me at 430 on Thursday and say, can you do this illustration that's due Friday at 4.30? So I had 24 oh, hours to do an illustration, you know, full painting. Um, you know, and they were smaller. They were spot illustrations. Didn't pay a huge amount of money. Um, but, you know, it, I had to do a painting in 24 hours. So I had a lot of training like that. And one thing I always did a lot of, like I was loved, I still do. Like I do full paintings that feature eyes. Like, you know, it's like the eyes of the window of the soul kind yeah. of thing. Like they're yeah, honestly yeah. so impressive. So, um, and even then I was, I had done for a horror novel, I did this one painting that was just like a, a landscape made of nothing but eyes, you know, tons and tons of oh, eyes wow. together. So in that one, you know, I just, it had good metaphorical, you know, storytelling to show the eye versus the symbiote, you know, goop stuff, mm-hmm. um, like, like lava flowing around as his, his human eye. Yeah. But yeah. it was, you know, it was just the kind of thing where I could feel at home. I was like, all right, when I, once I get to that eye, I know exactly what I'm doing because I oh, think that's so cool. <laughs> these darn things. It's it's quite bizarre because when I look at it, and I know you've done lots of other pieces, but this is the one that when I was looking through uh, the images this morning, this is the one that stood out for me because you, you kind of. Uh, we had did a similar uh, interview recently where where I was I was talking to the artist and and saying that the eye just says so much within that and and the expression and you can kind of take away that the eye is either possibly a little bit fearful um, possibly pleading for help but also potentially deranged you know mad you know um, uh, angry you know you're about to get it you know I I don't know there's so many things you can read into it no you can definitely see that level of madness there and then having the tongue hanging over the teeth is such a such a smart detail right it's not like this wild thing that you see a lot now with Venom, mm-hmm. which I think is still cool, but it's just this like rabid dog type of imagery that kind of yells out at you. I, I love yeah, it's just such a smart way to balance those two pieces of madness. Very sick. Yeah. So and one of the one of the funnest things about any of these characters too is is the fact that they're so, you know, the good ones at least, the good characters, they're so they have so much sort of metaphorical depth to them you know so so even if you're only you know you're someone who's in your especially this particular year 1995 you're someone who's stuck in your room basically with you know your your ideas your your paintbrush and a lot of coffee and you're sitting there doing this but you know you're drawing on the well of your whole life of experience and stuff and that that character like one of my favorite characters just in general is cable who i got to do a couple of times oh yeah because to me like i can really understand to, to me, the, the brilliance of that character is the fact that not only is he this, you know, he's this super muscular, strong, you know, warrior guy, of course, that's kind of like a given, but the fact that he has something inside him that is eating him, and, and he has to put so much of his power to just not let himself eat himself, which I think a lot of people can relate to that. Like, I, I can personally mm-hmm. relate to that, you know? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. And no. so, so when you're, you know, obviously you're depicting the the mythic you know comic book version but you know hopefully there's something else underneath it that if nothing else can occupy the artist and you can try your best to put in like a little you know whatever to just something that you're thinking of it that's more profound hopefully leaks out a little bit you know yeah, yeah well i mean you see it right especially with the one where you're kind of looking up a cable where you can kind of see inside of his gun and you have that like I don't know. I guess the '90s kind of like orange nuclear glow. <laughs> <type of thing. laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. 
<laughs> right, right. I love that. I don't know what it is. I see that and glow in the dark stuff. I'm like, I'm 90s. I'm back, baby. I'm ready to yeah. go. Well, it's, um, it's when it's when guns were allowed in Marvel cards. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, really. And guns, yeah. here's the thing too, right? You're so good at different textures. Like you get all those details. And with cable, you get skin, you get the latex, you get the metal arm, you get the guns, right? You get the belt buckles and the the depths and all that kind of stuff. And that piece, you're looking up a cable and I do see that. I do see that level of empathy and that 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 you know that anger and that rage that Cable kind of has is just mm. ah so sick. Such a sick piece. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, of, well, oh, sorry, go on. No, I was going to say one of the things I found interesting when I was looking at the images that, and it may just be that because I didn't look through all of the images, um, although even though I own them all, um, I noticed <laughs> a lot of them seem to be from a, a perspective of looking up. Yeah. Uh, the characters and i wondered if that was a conscious thing that you'd chosen to do uh for 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 a lot of them or if it was just naturally sort of happened you look back on it and you say oh okay i did this one from underneath i did this one from underneath i was wasn't sure if that was a particular style choice that you decided to do i think probably just because as i recall anyway it's, it's just because when you're plotting them out and taking reference pictures and doing all this stuff you, one of the main kind of mandates that you have obviously is is power you know what i mean if you're gonna put mm -hmm. one when you have, you have like a diagram of which words you're depicting, power is always going to be up there. Yeah. And yeah. So, you know, and, and so back then, one thing I discovered had, having to segue from just more traditional illustration to actually doing these, these comic book paintings, although I'd done lots of comic book you know, drawings for myself as a kid, but I hadn't actually worked in comics, you know, as a comic artist um, and still haven't. Uh, basically the size of the head is really important because if you draw somebody mm -hmm. like normal, even if they're very muscular, it could be like the most muscular person you've ever seen. They're going to look like a normal person. But then if you, you kind of have to make their head disproportionately slightly smaller. And the 90s, that was really very stylish. To me. So some, some places I went wrong. Like, sometimes it was like the head's like, nope, too small. And I look back at it now and I'm like, what the hell? Why didn't someone tap me to the shoulder and say the head was too small? <laughs> so, you know, so definitely, that could be a cautionary thing as well. Don't make the head oh, yes. too small. But which I did on several occasions. But um, <laughs> But but in general, you know, it's it's that kind of thing where you you draw something and you draw it and you think, oh, this looks awesome, and then you come back like the next morning fresh and you look at it and you're like, yeah, that guy looks like somebody I saw in the gym on Friday, but he doesn't <laughs> look like you know he's not cable, you know? <laughs> That's and, creeping in. Well, you know, it's funny actually. I have a question about that because like I I've, I've noticed that a lot. Like we've looked at like Julie's work and Boris's work and Joe Jusko's work and everybody else and um. I'm always fascinated. Like, I feel like I see people, <laughs> you know, especially from the <laughs> reference photos and stuff. And I'm like, you know, is that this person's, you know, wife or, or brother or something like that? Um, I always find that fascinating. So where do you like, because you, you mentioned it now, right? Because when you capture someone's like a fictional character's personality, right? That's, that's, that for me is like, you can do positioning, textures, be a skilled artist, all that kind of good stuff. Absolutely. But the devil's in the details, right? Like, how do you get this character to have Jubilee's face, right? How do you get this character to, for everyone to look at this and be like, oh, yeah, that's Gambit, right? Especially when it's a fictional character. Like, what, what were some things you did? Yeah, that's the hard part. I mean, that's absolutely the hardest part. You're right. I mean, because, yeah, if I was to break out, like, sketchbooks I have from, from then or, you know, whatever, that's where most of the work goes. Like, you might get, like, a decent composition. Like, yeah, that'll work. You might get, you know, everything looking pretty good, but to get it to look exactly like the person is supposed to, you know, and, and even just to have it in the, that realm of, you know, like, like, again, the question of why, like, showing from below, the realm of have it be sort of like, you know, gods amongst men kind of thing, which, you know, yeah. doesn't always work. I mean, you know, my, I, again, like, sometimes you do it and it works, sometimes you do it and it doesn't work. But but that's a real challenge, you know. That that's that's what makes it hard, you know. As opposed to because the one thing, like so, for instance, the Hildebrand brothers, you know, Greg and Tim Hildebrand, yeah. um, who when I was a kid were totally, you know, heroes of mine, and and they still are. I mean, their you know, their work is fantastic. Yeah. Um, yeah. I actually had a chance in high school. It's a weird long story. I will not go into, but uh, <laughs> my, a, a, girl, a, a girl I was going out with in high school. Her sister was going out with a guy who was a low-budget movie director named Ted Boas, who made uh, Attack of the Aliens, Deadly Spawn, I believe was his big claim to fame. Oh, um, yes. Yeah, and, it's, and it, it was kind of, you know, obviously in the, in the vein of alien 
uh, I don't want to say ripoffs, but, you know, uh, homages. <laughs> whatever, whatever homages. Was, <laughs> he's listening. Nice, nice guy. Um, and, you know, whatever, it did well. It was for, you know, for what he was going for. But anyway, they filmed this movie in my hometown, in my girlfriend's backyard. So I actually got to see them filming part of it, et cetera, et cetera. But in any case, because of this, she, me and through her was invited to watch them filming something at one of the Hildebrandt's houses, which is in New Jersey. I can't remember if it was Tim or Greg. But I couldn't go because I had a I had a wrestling match, right? As if I remember who won that wrestling match in 1982. <laughs> but, you know, I was afraid of my coach or whatever. So I said, you know, no, I can't go to this once in a lifetime opportunity. You go instead. So she did. <laughs> and, and she called me like later in the day and said, I said, how's it going? And she said, oh, I'm so bored. I'm sitting here in a studio. Just it's just all paintings everywhere. And I was oh. like, oh, come on. So she was no. like trapped in his studio with like paintings and art books and rare memorabilia that I would have killed to have seen. But apparently not. I wouldn't have killed <laughs> I was the wrestling man. But I didn't. <laughs> That's so, absolutely yeah. wonderful. Oh, I mean, yeah. he, I mean, you could look at it this way, and that because they did the 1994 set, they yes. were kind of your opening act. So if oh. you want to, if you want to, if you want to think of it like that, that might be make you feel better <laughs> yeah. about it. I think that's a bit, uh, I would like to think of it that way, except for it's not true. But, <laughs> yeah, no, no. <laughs> but, they, but they had a show actually in New York while I was working on the, the set that I, you know, the 95 Mark Lash pieces. They had a show of their cards um, in New York in like a smallish gallery. And I got to see them in person. And it was, it was tremendous. Oh, but the reason I met, the reason I brought them up um, was that as much as I like their work, it's a real kind of cautionary thing where when they were doing their Lord of the Rings stuff, like their Lord of the Rings calendars and all yeah. their. Lord of the Rings stuff, which before the, you know, Peter Jackson movies was the, the I mean, it still is for a lot of people and myself included in a lot of ways, but they, for the vast majority of their stuff, totally hit the nail on the head. And they'll have, you know, Aragorn is Aragorn. All the characters are the characters, not the reference, but occasionally there'll be a painting where you're like, oh, that's your chiropractor or that, that's your dentist with a sheet on him. You know what I mean? And it's it's kind of like, why does the painting before that, I buy that guy as like Elrond, the, you know, the elf king. And in this picture, it's like, nah, he's your chiropractor. I can tell, you know? It's weird. I don't know how, I don't know the difference. Like, I, I, I guess what I mean by this, like, I don't know if it's with the eyes. I don't know if it's the way the jaw sits or like, there's something where you look at a painting, you're like, that's a real person. That's not the fictional character. Yeah, it's just it's just really cool. Yeah, it is, it is. It is fascinating to me because obviously one of the things that that you very kindly did, and I absolutely love this, and we have talked about it on the podcast before, is you you shared a reference photo of yourself <laughs> in as as a much much younger man, although you'd barely tell the difference, um, in in a unitard posing for a Spider Man painting from Marvel yes. Masterpieces nineteen ninety five, um, that with your blessing I will share with this podcast episode <laughs> tasting notes. Um, am I, would I be right in thinking that there might be a, a, a draw full of those type of uh, reference pictures of you in various okay. poses? Box. Yes, I have boxes and boxes of those things. Yeah, because every every single picture, not just of the Marvel Bash pieces, but anything, you know, you don't, I don't just take one or two pictures. I would take, especially back then, now I'm a little better at it, but I would take, you know, tons and tons of those pictures. And that's also, I think, part of the answer to the question, too, uh, is, is that, um, you know, when you take these pictures, your level of commitment... Like in that picture, for instance, it's a, obviously it's a ridiculous picture. I totally, I totally understand that. I'm, I mean, I'm wearing my wife's unitard. I'm not even wearing. I, mean, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have a unitard. So you didn't even go buy your own. How dare you, sir? <laughs> I, I didn't even know it was your wife's. <laughs> yeah, so I'm a parasite. Yeah, I'm wearing my wife's like dance unitard, which made it even tighter and weirder. Um, but at the same time, when I'm take when I'm posing for the picture, I ha I'm have to be committed. Like I'm, I'm Spider Man. Well, you're in it. You're it's in it. Like I saw, I saw, yeah, no, I, I, I'm dead serious. Like, I love that. Like, I think that's the best part about it. Right. Cause you have to commit to the role and you're there. Yeah, you you're a like, method. You a method. I'm going to, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to be Spider-Man right now, but you know what though, in a way you kind of have to go to that level because then you got to be like, Oh, this is where the Spider-Man personality comes. Right. And this is going to sound hella corny and I can't believe I'm going to say it on air, but I'm gonna say it anyway. I think I know what you're going to say. I don't want to say it, but I'm going to say it. Cause whatever. Well, I'll say it if you don't. Okay. <laughs> I think there is a little bit of these characters in all of us, right? And you can channel that. And I yeah. think that's how you get those personalities, right? Especially if you're doing references. You're like, 
oh that's very spider-man-esque right or that's like oh, yeah, so yeah right. that kind of stuff yeah 100 percent. i yeah, think well, i was i was gonna go with truth of the character because i'm yes. theatrically trained so that's where oh, that's right. yeah, my head goes with that you know it's the whole stanislavski uh thing so but but yeah yes. but it, it but it is that you know i mean you, you kind of nailed it when you were doing it um and it's very similar to and i remember when i saw that picture i was very much um reminded of uh marvels the alex ross um series yes. which i, I believe yeah. came out around the same sort of time actually so it's interesting that you, you say you know the whole looking up and the gods among us which was very much the perspective of that that story but in the um it's the first time i'd seen it done but i think it was either it was either in the the back of the book so it was in the back of the first trade paperback that collected them he put in a lot of the reference photos that he'd done of his parents of his siblings you know and, and of him and it's the first time as someone who grew up with comics and 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 cards um i'd ever seen i, I didn't even know that 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 was a thing you know and i was you know i was in my 20s at that point and obviously i didn't you know, I'm not an artist, but so I, I think it's fascinating. So when you showed me that, that showed us that reference photo on the group, I was very much reminded of Alex Ross doing that for Marvels. And it just kind of, it kind of, of course, artists do that. Of course. Yeah. They do. But, you know, it's just not comic artists probably think. less just because they don't have time. Usually like a comic artist who are working on like monthly books. I mean, I know some of them, yeah. you know, depending on their style, some of them do that for everything just because that's their super, you know, super realistic style. But I think traditionally, like the kind, you know, who I grew up with, like obviously Jack Kirby, he was he wasn't using reference for the most part because he was churning out such a weird, you know, he was just going into a weird fugue state and producing <laughs> you know, the best stuff ever. You know, it's crazy. Um, but yeah, I mean, especially for paintings, I think people who are going to paint them, generally you're probably going to be, you know, at least have one foot more in the old like Norman Rockwell, uh, you know, illustration mm -hmm. camp where you're, yeah, I mean, speaking for myself, I, I need reference, especially then, I mean, the more you do it, you could still you get by with that reference because you've done it enough times but you still need reference i mean even people i'm not gonna name any names but even some some big um artists in the fantasy world you know some who were, were dead made a lot about the fact they didn't use reference and if you dig a little bit you can find their reference <laughs> so, it's, <laughs> like, so i've never done it and on their back walls, this giant poster of them and their wives' <laughs> loaded hearts. Yeah. <laughs> not everybody. I'm sure some people who say they don't use reference legitimately don't use reference. I'm not, you know. Yeah, right. <laughs> but some, some people, I think, put a bigger, like, a lot of their kind of self, uh, the view of their self is kind of tied up with the fact that they don't. Yeah. Like, I don't need uh, reference. Like, all right, well, I, I'm here to say I do. <laughs> yeah. And what's wrong with having fun with it, too? I can imagine that's a nice little break, too, in a way, right? Because it does, I mean, it must be a little bit more immersive for you as an artist because you are taking the body, you, you're embodying that character, and then you're using that image. Like, there has to be some kind of psychological hype <laughs> and stuff going into having a yeah. reference as well, especially when you're doing your own posing. Like, I, I just find that so interesting. Oh, it's, I think it's, it's, it's a huge amount of fun, uh, especially because... Uh, you know, like you were saying, just the whole theatrical part of it. I mean, my dad was an actor, and, and I think awesome. that I think there's a lot of theater. You know, obviously there's a lot of drama in most artists, especially if your art is you know dramatic by by nature. Yeah. Um, and it's just kind of like the one level of remove. So if you actually are an actor, like my wife was an actress, and it, but then you are the artwork. You know, whereas if you're someone maybe a little less out, you know, outgoing or whatever you may kind of perform on paper, or you may perform on canvas, but this is like the first draft where you're alone in your house or with your, you know, my wife, you know, McKinley, my wife kindly taking these. <laughs> now I do it myself with my camera, but it's easier now. But, um, you know, it, it's just, it, you get to perform and you get to actually be the character. Like when I was a kid, I mean, you know, I, my parents, my aunts, uncles, I mean, you know, probably a very typical story. They thought I was crazy. Like they, they thought like, you know, like I was on the stairs with like G.I. Joe's or my little Spider-Man characters. And I'm like, when the, when the origins of Marvel Comics came out, I had a cassette recorder and I performed that entire book like as a radio show. And if if I so I actually played all the characters, read all the, you know, read all the, you know, the, like, like, You're officially my hero. <laughs> <laughs> and it was crazy. You know what I mean? Like I wish I could find awesome. the cassettes now. But it's just like another outlet for that same thing. So it's like, yeah. you know, you say the, the superheroes are in all of this. Of course, I mean, that's why it's, it's and again, it's so cliche because people have said these things so many times, but that doesn't mean it's not true. It just means it's, it is true. That's why people keep saying it. 
that it's it's a mythology. It's a modern mythology. Yes. Um, you know, and I just I just recently uh, got a master's degree in in fine art because I teach also, and it's you know part, I mean I like to learn. It's partially it's a virtuous thing I did, but more yeah. than that, it's, I just got paid more money at work if I got a master's degree. So ain't that the I, truth? Yeah. I, 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 <laughs> And I got it in fine art because just the schools around me, you know, I couldn't get it. And if I could have afforded uh, to go to New York City and get like the masters in sequential uh, art, I would have done that. But it would have been like sixty thousand dollars, and you have to quit your job. So that's not really a good oh, combination. Of no. things. And there's not a lot of places that offer that degree either. That degree's still very specific. Yeah, I mean, SVA is the. I'm sure the other one too, but SVA is the one that I was I was thinking of. But in any case, I got it in fine art, and part of the whole you know, a fine art thing, which really was helpful, was just sort of the idea of, of um, actually, as I'm saying this, I've totally lost the thread of why I was even saying this. <laughs> so I'm going I'm to keep going and maybe it'll come back to it. But what, this might not be what I originally intended to say, but one of the things that is really interesting about the fine art thing is the idea that the art is left partially, okay, I just remember what I was going to say. I learned about Postmodernism. Like I was, people always talk about postmodernism. What the heck is postmodernism? I had no idea, but I think I kind of know now. And part of it is the fact that we sort of, in the whole world, have lost our shared. Like, say you're in the Middle Ages, right? Not a great time to live, but everybody kind of, at least in Europe, I'm just going to stick to Europe. Everybody believed in the same thing, right? You might be religious, not religious, but you kind of buy the same thing. You do good, you go to heaven. You do bad, you burn in hell. All right, we're all agreed, more or less. Okay. Now, no one agrees on anything, right? We don't have the same, obviously not the same religions. We don't even believe on the definitions of what reality is anymore. What, you Yikes. know. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> so Agenda. Whole, like, yeah, I mean, so everything is so kind of schismed that there's no kind of underlying agreement. So things like comics, I mean, partly the, the success of the whole Marvel Cinematic Universe is that it kind of is a religion that we can all kind of share. You know, not a religion. We don't pray to these things, really. But, but it is it does fill a void, I think, in kind of you know, belief is strong, but kind of because it's like a metaphor for good and evil. And, you, you know, someone cuts you off on the road and you, you think like, oh, man, that sucks. I, I, I'm assuming there is some kind of justice in the universe and that guy will spill a cup of hot coffee on his lap later today to even it all out. You know what I mean? It, also, it the characters. Happen. Yeah, the characters, too, like you saying, you know, like you look at someone who's like Spider-Man, right? Especially in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, you know, that's valuing sciences and education and not having to be a brute or a jock or any of this other kind of stuff that does have negative commentations, right? And a lot of these movies are changing those definitions on the old comic books that we grew up on. And having these kind of, I guess, reassurances, if that makes sense, right? You're like, oh, right. Obviously, doing this thing and helping somebody else is the right thing to do. Because you are getting all those emotional um, senses when you go to watch these movies. You yeah. do feel akin to these characters. You do feel attached and you do feel like a little piece of you are is accomplishing this great feat. And that is really gratifying and really therapeutic, right? And getting all of our morals from these larger cinematic uh, events is very much a part of our culture. Right. It's the thing we constantly come back to to understand ourselves now. Right. Because you're right. The sense of community is very detached. Right. There is a very much, especially in America, an individual sense about who we are and we are separate. And all I have to do is take care of myself. If you want to be rich yeah. and famous, you have to build yourself up by your bootstraps or whatever it is. Right. Yeah. The, the <laughs> kind of psychotic <laughs> stuff yeah. that that is. You know what I mean? But yeah, in very much right now, when we go have these shared experiences in theaters or with these characters, we are partaking in this kind of mythos, yeah. and a modern mythos right now. Yeah. But people crave, people crave, which is the ironic thing is that the more, the more that social media in particular makes people very much um, isolated and only connecting through social media. You know, there is a, there is a, a lot to be said about people who, who, who may be sat there with a family and they're all on their phones and they're all on separate Facebooks, you know, and, yeah, I'm as guilty of that as, as anyone but um but but people do crave shared cultural experiences um which is you know which is why the, you know you have the movie theater thing you have the the whole you know if there's a hit play that opens and it's only going to be on three months you know you've got to you know everyone's got to go and see it and it becomes a hit and it sells out and you, you know you have to pay 500 bucks for a ticket or <laughs> um but um 
but it, it, it is interesting that with um, things like Netflix and a new, um, you know, the, the, the way that people consume new cultural things has changed as well. You know, you have that binge thing so that you can see it and be able to talk about it on Monday when you're back yeah. at the office and you're back, you know, back around the water cooler and, you know, talking about it. If it dropped on Friday, you know, you've got to see it that weekend. It is very interesting that, that, that that's the case. And I think, um, I think just just bringing it slightly back towards towards cards and comics. Cards and comics, I, I generally find that people do because there's such a breadth of of comics and card sets now. I mean, obviously you, we worked on a number in the nineties. I mean, there are there are an awful lot more of them now, as I'm, you may or may not be aware of. Um, but people are tending to discover them as they go, which which I think is is a different different things so i i was um chatting to someone in, in one of the groups who has literally just discovered the set that you worked on for the for the first time and he doesn't he's like a three-legged dog in a forest doesn't know which way to turn because he just wants <laughs> to get you know he just wants to get them he keeps seeing the art and he just wants to own them uh, whereas you have the other end of the spectrum it's like people looking and going oh yeah i had that when i was 12 and it's, yeah. it, and now they're you know now they're in their forties or the but that know, that is a community mass. thing too yeah. right because like it people is. from the past and people from the present are kind of like still sharing these things yes. yeah yeah, yeah. Which, and that's yeah. And to me like also like you were saying before I mean the kind of art that you did see when you were twelve years old to me also very much has a real like totemic power to it like when I found my comic books again and I had convinced my this is the kind of stuff I do I convinced myself that my comic books were gone and my wife had told me she said no they're in the basement someplace in a box. And I'd say, no, they're not. They're gone. <laughs> and, and she'd be like, all right, well, I just told you. And then, like, I finally went around to got around to looking, and I was like, holy crap, they're right there in the box. And this was like, like for like thirty years, I've been, I've been thinking they were gone. I, I just found them. And, and I it, saw the picture on your Instagram as well. <laughs> oh, it's so oh yeah, it's, oh, it's fantastic. It's really, but when I look at them, right, it's not just. It's like I'm seeing the original juice, like the original raw current that went through my wow. veins. And I see those images and I remember them not just as they are on the page, but I remember how they looked in my head back in 1973. And they looked at, you know, and it's really so magical. Like, so, so I have a, you know, real connection to like 70s Marvel comics. To me, that's yeah. not all of it, but there's a certain, like, the art, especially, like the storytelling. You know, obviously, it'll be Mary Jane Watts, it'll be, you see, like, you know, ch check me out, you groovy cats. And it's like, nah, <laughs> I'm not, that's not really aging well. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but just the art, especially people like, like again, like, like uh, John Romita, John Buscema, like when yeah. they were like, when they had like a rawness to them, like most artists, I think, I just heard someone talking about this the other day, when they get too polished, it, it can be, it, it just kind of gets more boring, but when they still kind of have warts and they're kind of a little still, you can see the struggle, it's more interesting, you know, I think, personally. I love that. I love that, like storytelling through like an artist's skill, right? Like the refinement and yeah. that kind of stuff. Oh, wow. Really interesting. Wow. Yeah. So, so you finish these, you finish these 50, yeah. you turn them in. Okay. <laughs> so, so you must have, so, cause the set came out in 95. So were you working on them from, from 94 through 95? Was it, yeah. was that the, yeah. So they, they, they come out. Had you ever met or encountered any of the other three artists that worked on the set beforehand? Well, I had not encountered them before we started the set, but uh, once we were doing it, they would send us. I was I would say that this year was the the one year I was rich and famous. So I was they would send us <laughs> to all over the country, like you know San Diego. Obviously, they sent us to Chicago. I was going to ask York. about San Diego. Yeah, yeah, that, that was awesome. But like so often, you'd be we they put some of us together. So for instance, I spent one day in Chicago sitting next to Nelson for the whole day, who's who's a great guy. He's just he's just a really hilarious, funny guy. I spent also a day sitting next to Dave DeVries, also a wonderful guy. Um, Dimitri, yeah, I'm, sure, I'm sure he's a wonderful guy too. I just, I don't think we ever actually met though. But the other two, yes. And, and a funny thing, just a, a brief funny thing. Um, the high school that I went to, it's also the high school that I, I teach art at now, is basically, it's a Northern Valley Regional High School in Denver, just for, for the, for, for what it is. Um, I'm sitting next to Nelson in Chicago and we're spending all day together. So, you know, sometimes there's a lot of people, you're, you're signing stuff, it's busy. And that's not, you know, no one's there. So it's, you know, you're just, we're just shooting the breeze. We're just talking. And I said to him, I heard you're from New Jersey, right? And he said, yeah, I'm from a little town up in Northern New Jersey. And I said, Oh really? Where? And he told me the town 
And it's the same town that I live in. And I said, where'd you go to high school? And he said, oh, I went to Northern Valley Regional High School, which is the same high school that I went to. So two of the four Marvel Masterpieces artists from our set <laughs> went to the same high school. And it's not like... Something's know, in the water on that one. Yeah, nothing against my school, but it wasn't like it was like, you know, like, yes, it's a school where we breed Marvel Masterpieces artists. It's, it's, <laughs> it's just a school, you know? We just happen to be the, you know... Although I teach there now, so maybe now we will be a school that breeds Marvel Masterpieces. Well, that's that's a lovely. I love that kind of you know full circle kind of thing going on there. We um we I, I don't know if you you listened to it, but we uh, D- Dave DeVries came on um, episode I four, did. I did uh, and he he alluded to some crazy stories about your times when you were um, doing San Diego, which is why I had it on my list to ask. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to. I actually did Google um to see if i could find any photos and of course you know it, it, photos from the 90s unless they're scanned in they're not digital so i didn't find anything but i was curious to, to see you know could, did you do a panel or did you do was it just signings or what, what did they have you do as we also i remember I remember doing at least one panel at san diego as well which was a lot of fun um mo- i remember the signings mostly um i also remember that the other artists uh, that i would work with but both uh, dave and nelson were both like much better with fans than I was. I wasn't bad with fans, but they were more totally immersed in the world of comics, I think. Yeah. Whereas I had been, you know, as much as I'm totally a comic guy, I was, especially at that time, I was coming more from the world of illustration. So that was mm. really more, except for these couple of years we're talking about, that's kind of what I was spending my time doing. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So I didn't really have, so <laughs> just occasionally, you know, you'd have a comic fan come up and say something like, like, I really didn't like the way you did Captain America or something. And, and, and I just would be like, I'd say like, well, let's see you do it or something like that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, it was, like I didn't have that. Whereas I'd watch them. I'd watch both Dave and Nelson and they were just so much better like politicians in a good yeah. way. You know, like they would say, so if someone said something like that to them, they would say something like, well, you know, I was going for more of a, I don't know, they would have some like artistic illusion for comics mm. in the 50s or something, you know. <laughs> so it's kind of taking notes like, you know, I should be more like them in that way because it's really, you know. <laughs> Why was I paying me to sit here and be like the, the snarky mean guy, which I normally wasn't like, just, you know. No, I think that's the appropriate response anyway. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll see you do it. Let's do yeah. this. Yeah. 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 You want to, you want to do it? You can do better than that. Fine. Um, <laughs> so, you, so you turn them in, you're doing the, you're doing the prom, promo uh, for the tour. And then obviously the set, set comes out i imagine you you know once you've turned them in and you're doing you, you're doing other work you know non marvel possibly you know keeping the bills paid um did you do the flair spider-man work after marvel masterpieces were you kind of currently with it i mean the last one i did was actually one of the uh the um the spider-man ones but they were kind of at the same time but at the at the very end i think you know yeah. so kind of like yeah so i think they were somewhat concurrent yeah. But, you know, but a funny thing was during the whole Marvel thing, I, I was, you know, enjoying it, obviously. I was having a great time and I really wanted to kind of keep it going. So what I did during this whole time, I'm sure where I found the time for this, but I kind of wrote up like a treatment for, like you said, like, um, uh, you know, Marvels had come out. And, and so obviously graphic novels were, were big. And I really wanted to do a graphic novel starring a couple of my favorite characters who at the time weren't being used. So I was going to do Morbius. Uh, kind of teaming up with uh, Deathlock, the Demolisher, right? So it's kind of like a Frankenstein, ooh, ooh. Dracula. Yeah, that's nice. a good one. Yeah, and, and, and now, obviously, you know, Morbius is coming out of the movie and Deathlock's kind of come back. But back then, they were, like, totally just, like, you know, in the dustbin. Like, nobody was nobody was using them. So I said, well, that'd be really cool. So I wrote, like, a, a treatment. Like, I wrote a whole thing. Um, and I did a sample page of it. And I can't, I cannot remember, terrible with names. I can't remember who it was I talked to at Marvel. But just as this was kind of winding down, I was trying to get the ball rolling to move on from the Marvel Masterpieces to move on to that. And they were very receptive. You know, they were like, really like, oh, let's meet. Let's talk about it. And this was exactly when Marvel was imploding. This was exactly when they were going back. So I had this experience. And it's one of these experiences where I remember it. But I'm not sure if I remember the actual experience or if I just remember me telling the story. So I'm not 100 percent sure, you know. (laughs) So if like the watcher could come down and like, you know, he could correct me. If he was <laughs> but but my memory of it is, and there definitely is, I, I, I think this is true. I mean, you know, whatever. Um, I was supposed to have a meeting, say, on Tuesday with whoever this person was, more in the graphic novel. I don't think it, was, it wasn't Tom Brevoort, but whoever it was. 
And I called on Monday morning just to kind of like solidify it, just so we're still on for one o'clock or whatever. And the morning I called, the person I was dealing with was no longer working for them. They said like, oh, they no longer work for us. And I was like, oh, well, could I, could I then talk to like, and I, I thought of the next person I knew and that person didn't work there either. <laughs> so like, so wow. something, something was happening. So I was kind of calling like right in the middle of when the, you know, the, the world was on fire and the company was like imploding. And so, you know, that nice. didn't happen. <laughs> now there's, there's a what if. Speaking of the there, that's a what if. There's a what if. What <laughs> yeah. if that hadn't happened? Yeah. And you'd gone ahead because Marvel went deep into the um they, they did a number of them with the success of Marvels. They did um they did some fully painted artwork follow ups. Yeah. Uh they did a they did a single Tales to Astonish, they did a Tales of Suspense, um under the Marvel Select banner and so they had acetate covers and they were kind of square bound yeah. beautiful books and i think they did it right through until about 2000 2001 um uh, they did a number i think the last one i think they did was a was a piece just after um 9 11 uh, like a memorial piece um for the firefighters um fund um but i have in my hand you probably haven't seen this for a while cards <laughs> illustrated <laughs> i remember all- that <laughs> from uh december 95 issue 24 which i have actually i did i did raise this uh when dave was on the um uh podcast <laughs> as well and on the front it says marvel masterpieces devries patelis nelson and scanlon compare notes on classic characters so uh what i <laughs> what i thought i'd do was just have a look at this article which i i absolutely love and i'm going to scan this in um and for those who who um you see, here, here we go. I'm straight away. I've turned to your quote about Venom. Um, uh, pick and mix. When asked what their favourite piece done for the set, all the artists chose different characters. Scanlon. I liked Venom. It was just a portrait of his head. I got to do lots of teeth, and he's got shiny red gums, so that was fun. <laughs> sure enough. It, <laughs> it's absolutely brilliant. I love it. I love these articles. These these, these magazines are just proper time capsules but what i love um and this probably won't come out on the webcam at all but i'll still hold it up is that there's some sketches and i very rarely see any any sketches at all from these 90 sets um i imagine they either weren't digitized or they weren't you know reproduced or you know they may still be in existence and you, you mentioned um sketchbooks for example so do you do you do you do you find that you've kept a lot of the kind of work from that time or i mean i mean the original paintings notwithstanding yeah yeah i think so i mean i mean basically like i'm much better now like i actually have now much more of a um a prolific sketchbook artist now like i have stacks and stacks and stacks of sketchbooks i even like i number every single page and now i'm up to wow. just the last and i've only been doing the numbering for the last like say seven years or something like that and i'm up to like page four thousand something so like i i, I do it all the time like i'm really yeah. a I'm, it's almost like an obsess, obsessive compulsive sketching disorder. Like I'm like I, I constantly, I'm constantly doing it. But um, back then it wasn't quite as much. And I wouldn't, and plus I didn't have as much time. So so there would be like so for instance like the sketches you had in that magazine there. They'd be like maybe a, a few pages of that, and I definitely mm. still have those in sketchbooks. So yes. Um, other than if they were on pieces of paper that I didn't happen to have them in my sketchbooks, yeah, it, it would. There, there's quite a bit of sketching going on. Yeah, that's what yeah, I would like though, because that's where you catch a lot of the stuff that now haunts me. Because if you can sketch it, you'll catch it. Yeah, it seems. I mean, it's interesting. A lot of the artists we've spoken to, there, there seems to be a, a kind of a, a a standard form. Well, I think some artists do things differently. I know um, uh, Bion- Bionchi, um, uh, what we saw on the Marvel Masterpieces 2018. Uh, did, have you seen those newer uh, works that, uh, that have happened? Little, on Instagram, I see them occasionally, but I was actually kind of surprised just recently. Like, I did not realize that I did not realize that they were still as you know extant as they are. That mm. came surprise me. And I've seen some of his. I mean, he's real. Obviously, he's really good. Um, but I'm going to look up more of those because that's, yeah. that's a relatively recent discovery on my part. Yeah, because the because the, the the first run, if you like, the first volume ended with Julian Boris in '96, and then there was a 2007, 2008. There were three sets then, but they were all reused artwork from mm-hmm. uh, from other sources, and so uh, 2016, uh, Joe Jusco came back and had another swing at it, <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and then some. Um, it took him years, literally, because you see some of the paintings are dated 2014. 
and it didn't come no. out until 2016. Um, and then <laughs> Simone. He's just yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, his work is just astonishing. And uh, uh, it's good evening. Especially because, I mean, like, you know, talk about someone like, like John Basema and, and the idea of like someone like myself who's trying to, you know, like you were talking about before, you know, trying to make it look like the character and how that's such a struggle, as opposed to a comic artist like John Basema, who that's, I mean, I'm sure that was hard for him too, the first, you know, couple of thousand pages he did back in the 50s or whatever you know but so much experience and how he could just sit down I'm sure and just draw like you know conan who absolutely is not just recognizably conan but the essence of conan in like you know 12 brush strokes or pen strokes whatever you well, know and i think jesco joe jesco i think has he has some of that you know oh yeah most most certainly he does yeah. i don't yeah. know um um, we uh, we we recently did an episode where we were talking about the the earliest um, sketch cards that that came into Marvel sets, and it's around ninety eight um, kind of time they started, and they were literally just that they were sketches, and they were these big artists. You had Romita, you had Bashema, uh, you had Gene Colan doing it, Maurice Severin doing it, and and they were very you know very very rough sketches black and white pencil ink but immediately you could see you know who it is and it was yeah. very very recognizable and you could just see you know how quickly they were trained to do it because obviously they've got all these comics to put out you know back yeah. in the 50s and 60s even yeah, Stan Lee like, got in on that. yeah just the, they get to like the dna of the characters like if you're someone yeah. i just it's funny i just actually bought um from a, I'm trying to like buy from my local comic store online, just you know, obviously just as much as possible. Yeah. Um, and I just got some uh, old, oh, what is it? I think Cole the Conqueror from Marie Severin. Oh, and nice. I've got like old comics when I was a kid. You know, Marie Severin, like you know, filling in on like the Hulk or Avengers or or you know whatever, just different things. But this is like really, it's like 19th century illustration. It's like a kind of. It looks like she really had a good time. Like it looks like yeah. she was really kind of in her element. Um, so I just I just placed an order from uh, some other comic place. I can't remember where to buy a couple other issues. Like I love I love comics I missed in like 1971 because I was only yep. in first grade. <laughs> so now I can go back and like like oh I I missed that. So now I can go back and you know buy a run of whatever. It's 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 fantastic. It's it's good use of my my plague time. <laughs> my plague time. Well, yeah, it's as good a use as any. Um, and we, we, we were talking to um, Simone. Um, very kindly did a Q and A on our on our uh, Facebook group. Um, it didn't actually save, unfortunately, so it's lost to the ages now. But in that, he he was telling us it, it took him fifteen months to do the I think one hundred and thirty five pieces for Masterpieces twenty eighteen, and that was kind of full time. You know, 15 yeah. months he just he just so. did it and uh but he actually planned it out he didn't feel like he rushed it and he actually had a little bit of time to go back and review things in the last few weeks um so i think he felt very like from i got the sense he felt very creatively like he'd nailed it on that one um do you you mentioned before that there were some pieces that you you maybe look at now and you're like oh you know i wish i had a, an, another swing of it they came back and asked you would you would you want to Oh yeah, absolutely, sure. Uh, I yeah, I think that was one of the best years I ever had in my life creatively, just because it was so, you know, the intensity was was you know intense, obviously, but um, yeah, it was just a great time, and and just I'm I'm just so connected, to the, just the whole mythic nature of them and the whole personal nature we've talked about, you know, being yeah. that it's kind of like your again like the wellspring of your original create. Yeah, so I just absolutely, yeah, especially yeah. the one that screwed up. <laughs> yeah. well we'll get we'll get on the phone um i noticed um uh, dave devries had recently started to do a few original pieces um, there was a marvel flare set it's one thing that upper deck who've got the license now do is uh, they have been producing um reviving old 90s card brands so marvel universe no marvel universe is the one they haven't done yet although i think they probably will do uh but masterpieces obviously came back in 2016 and 2018 and is coming out again hopefully this year plague notwithstanding um <laughs> and the um but marvel flair they did a set last year and dave did a number of pieces on that um, i remember we, when we were talking to him he was like a lot of the people that he was talking to hadn't didn't really know and especially at marvel who have to approve all the artists you know hadn't 
you know, it's a new generation of people there now. So it's like, it's, it's almost like he, he kind of alluded to the fact that he had to kind of prove himself again. <laughs> it's like, you know, well, oh, sure, yeah. just go back and look at that. You know, I've, I've I know it. that was so crazy to me when he said that. I was like, what do you mean prove himself again? It's done, baby. Like, but, what is <laughs> Yeah. But it's bizarre. But, you know, I, I'll get, I guess it makes sense if, 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 if you think of it like, you know, a new generation. Um, but he did a he did a piece that was um, I can't remember the character now. It might have been Wonder Man. And, you know, he does that very forced perspective mm-hmm. kind of thing. Yeah. And he did Wonder Man and it, he did it as very much a companion piece to a piece that he'd done, I think, on 95, where he, a character was fighting another character. And so this one, he put a tiny little detail just in the glasses of Wonder Man, of a reflection of the of the previous piece and the character <laughs> that had been fighting, which I think mean, is absolutely superb. Superb yeah, little detail. Um, I'll send. I don't know if you've seen that image. I'll send it to you uh, yeah, afterwards. Just, uh, so you, can, you can have a look at it. Um, I, I just, I'm just slowly catching on to the fact that this is going on. Like, like, uh, like you're mentioning that, and then I think I did see. I'm not, again, I'm not sure if it was on Facebook or Instagram or someplace, but I think I did I did see something that, that Dave was doing, and in, in, I can't remember what it was. But, but yeah, I'm just kind of it's kind of slowly dawning on me that the world has continued to turn while I've been in my uh, my ivory tower here. Well, yeah, <laughs> at least you've got an ivory tower, which is probably the safest place to be right now. Um, do um um uh, my question's gone out of my head completely i was about to ask you something and i'm, I'm sure it's going to be hugely enlightening um so <laughs> since so you you mentioned it was kind of at your time at marvel so i'm guessing that after that 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 period where you worked on certainly the x-men set then masterpieces being the main one and then the spider-man that and then marvel kind of went <laughs> for want of a better expression that's going to sound great on the podcast i'm keeping it <laughs> yeah, i'm going to take it out of the recording and we're going to save that thank it's you accurate. brilliant um i'm guessing that was kind of it pretty much yeah um after that i went back to my regular sort of like uh you know illustration world which i mean obviously this was illustration too but yeah. then i went back to just more the the world that i had i had come from um you know, I guess if if Marvel had been more of my if if it had kind of been more a larger percentage of what I had to do, I probably would have stayed closer to it and just you know seen what I could pull out of the rubble and then you know sort of been there more for the the reawakening kind of thing. But since since I wasn't, I just you know again I had to pay my bills, so I went back to book covers and record albums, and I actually had like yeah right after the Marvel thing, I did a, like a Kiss album cover, which was which was um, uh, oh, pretty cool. funny for Psycho Circus, one of their albums, and oh. just. A, Wonderful. A funny, a funny, <laughs> a funny side note for that is, and I show my students this because they get a huge kick out of this. That there are people right now walking around this planet who have my face tattooed on their body, right? But they don't know it's me because basically there's an evil clown on the album, and I'm the evil clown. Like so, I basically my wife made me up and you know took the pictures. And oh I'm my the goodness, clown. I'm looking at it now. Uh, <laughs> that's that, that's me, that clown. So I was like 40 foot, behind, you know, tall behind them on stage and all this stuff. Um, and people tattooed my face on them, meaning it's the evil clown from Kiss's face, but it's my face. So that's awesome. <laughs> I, see, I love this. I love this kind of trivia detail. Right, right, other, <laughs> any other albums we should be aware of to look out for? <laughs> well, I did, uh, I did actually one of a uh, uh, Slick Rick is actually he's like sort of a very proto um, hip hop artist. Uh, Artist. This was actually before the Marvel Comics thing. So I did, uh, yeah, Slick Rick. I think it was, I think it was called Slick Rick 12 Inch, I believe. Or uh, it, I know it has the single Teenage Love, I believe, on it. Um, and this one is irritating because, I mean, not the album cover. The album cover I had a great time doing it. And that's actually like some of my students who are big hip hop fans. They they're they know more about Slick Rick than I do. So that that's the most impressive th- thing to them. But this is one where, like, CBS Records, like, when I turned in the job, they just kind of, like, they just, like, ate my painting. Like, I was, I was really young, and it just, it, you know, it never, who has my painting now? I don't know. I'll never see it, but I'd like to have that one. <laughs> is, that, is that the one of him with the glasses with the teeth? Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's freaking classic. The big gold, the big gold <laughs> teeth. <laughs> you know, this brings up a good question. So what painting would you like to have back, right? Have back like a marvel that, that, masterpiece or anything like that like which one would this, you well, this assumes you no longer have them yeah well i'm yeah. assuming yeah marvel masterpieces I actually have most of those because i'm i've actually been very um uh um, we'll, we'll talk afterwards <laughs> okay those have been very, uh, i just the, those i guess probably mostly because they they're so um kind of interwoven with my life you know, you know what i mean like the, like so for instance like 
you know, my, my children were, but the time I did the Marvel masterpieces, my, my kids were being born either then or right after my parents had actually just died. Like it was the whole, like my whole world was totally in a, like on a pivot, you know, yeah. turning. So they're so kind of like, like stitched into my life that I think I usually just, you know, I, that's, I just hang on to them pretty much. Um, but, but the, so the paintings I don't have more were ones I did for jobs that people, you know, kept and they shouldn't have kept. Yeah. And uh -huh. I had like one of the first jobs I got, I got out of, out of art school was I did the entire illustrations for a book of, um, horror stories by Charles Beaumont, who was one of the Twilight Zone. Oh, um, wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And it was, they're all black and white. It was a really great first job to have because they were in black and white. So it kind of like reminded me of the power of, of like value, you know, before color. And it was just really a perfect job to have. Um, and, yeah, and I sent those away. And the person who published the book, a relatively small publisher, just like, like kept the paintings. And, you know, and I, I was after it for a while, but, you know, it's uh, short of showing up at their house with like a baseball bat. There's not, you know, much you can do. <laughs> Well, so we'll well, you up, call we'll us up, up, okay? We'll round up the boys. <laughs> Trust me, we'll, we'll, we have a couple of people in our corner in our group, so you just let us know time and place. Round of yeah. a posse and head for. We'll, we'll edit this out. Don't worry. We'll, we'll, <laughs> you have a map in the back. We'll figure this out. It's not the right map, but we'll, you know, we'll get the right one. We'll, we'll figure get this. there. We'll get there. <laughs> Do you? Um, so, so I know now you, you teach, um, and and actually, actually, so does um, uh, Dave uh, DeVries, yeah, exactly. um is also a teacher, and um, he he. He he posted something recently where he every now and again I get a glimpse from his Facebook of how um, his students are receptive to and how he's inspired by how they re you know receive to his work. So do you teach? Um, I'm guessing you teach art or fine art related mm -hmm. yeah. um, uh, topics. What kind of age age range is it? Is it high school? Yeah, it's high school. Okay, because knowing you're a teacher as well, aren't you? So yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I, I teach, I teach, uh, I teach film and screenwriting. Yeah, cool. Anything creative? I mean, because it's it's just great to to be like a you know, just to help them to find their creativity. Because depending where you live, I'm sure, but I think just even our whole culture. Mm -hmm. um, and I, so I assume this is in England too. Just basically this whole Western culture thing. You know, creativity is not prized as it should be. You know, and and I always start at the beginning of the yeah. year just showing a picture of the brain. I know the left brain, right brain thing is under attack as far as being not you know maybe neurologically you know, specifically accurate, but I think metaphorically it, it definitely yep. is, is true. And, and, you know, the two lobes of your brain are, are the same size for a reason. Nature isn't capricious. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's right. not like the rational linear thinking side is huge. And the creative side is a little tiny P next to it. It's like, they're both equally significant to our survival and why we're such awesome and terrifying creatures, you know? <laughs> so. I, I think also too, like, you know, the things I remember from being in classes that spoke about creative things, you know, I've had tons of workshops, um, you know, for poetry and screenwriting and all this other kind of stuff, which, you know, is a hell in its own world, uh, workshopping <laughs> with other people. But I think the thing I always appreciate that I tend to do as well is, you know, telling my students that, hey, that thing you do, right, where you have action figures and you're throwing them down staircases, which I did as well, right? Or like, you know, that thing you do where you're looking at someone on the street and you create this whole backstory, right? These things you do are known to see about lighting. This is value, right? These are stories. These are ways to communicate. Probably the hardest thing to do for human culture throughout all time has been communication. And art is a way of being empathetic. It's a way of connecting to people. Right. It's it's extremely valued. And when I heard that kind of stuff in schooling and the stuff I teach now, it made me feel like I was a contributor in the world. Right. It made me feel like I was a part of it, it made me something I had to contribute. And, yeah, I think that's a fantastic thing to do. Yeah, it's, it's very gratifying. And even just the idea that, like, I would say, like, a school is almost like a zoo, you know, and you walk into one classroom and, like, there's an aardvark and one classroom, it's an emu, one classroom is an elephant. And the students look and they're like, oh, I think I'm more like that. I think maybe I'm an aardvark or maybe I'm this, as opposed to society saying, no, you should all be, you know, rhinoceroses or whatever, you know. And that's yeah. kind of the way it is. It's like, it's like, it's like, no, you should all be um, taking STEM classes. And if you're not good at math, you're an idiot. If you're not this. And then you get some art kid who's like, all right, well, I, I, I can't. I fail math like when I was a kid. I would fail math immediately. I couldn't. I couldn't. Math was like like I, I had an allergy to it. And I had classes. This is back in the seventies. I had a chemistry class a teacher who would make us publicly announce our percentage of error for like these calculations. 
And yeah, the wow. person before me would say like, oh, 4% error. And the, and the next person would be like, you know, 8%. And they get to me and I'd say 67% error. And he'd say, no, no, percentage of error. And I'd say, that is my percentage of error. What do you, what do you, what do you want from me? You know, what you, do, right? you know, I'll draw you, I'll draw you a picture. Come on. So, Jeez. you know, so, so there's a real value to me. Like one thing I find very, very helpful and very, you know, just redeeming socially and personally um, is that you can, you can tell your kids like, yeah, you're, you're absolutely a freak. I'm a freak too. And, yeah. and okay. That's, that's our, that's our tribe. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, and all that means is you're not the thing in the middle that the other people in the middle tell you is what you should be. Right. You know, there's no qualitative value to it other than that. It's just, it's just a weird poll that people took and didn't invite you to fill in your answer. <laughs> yeah. I love that so I much. We're yeah. used to those. Um, do you, um, do you find your, um, do you, do you still get, do you get asked to do commissions or, or, uh, or attend any cons or signings or anything like that? Do you still have anyone asking you to do that? Uh, not so much commissions, um, just because I don't really publicize that too much. But I was, we were supposed to, actually Dave had, Dave DeVries had organized something that this summer we were going to, three of the four of us were going to actually be, go to a convention together. I was going to ask about a reunion, yeah. Yeah, but, <laughs> uh, but because of the, you know, current situation, yeah, I'm assuming, sure. you know, I'm assuming that's put on hold or whatever. Uh, so, yeah, so, 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 but yeah, not so much commissions. And honestly, like, like I said before, like I'm, I'm kind of working on my own stuff. I'm working on a, a graphic novel that I'm hoping in about a year from now, I'll be, you know, kind of like presenting more uh, publicly. And I, I should start doing stuff on, on Instagram though, just because I'm, I'm, I'm a terrible, uh, promoter, businessman, every, everything that's everything other than the art part that <laughs> supports success of art. I'm like, you know, I guess it's like my chemistry class all over again. <laughs> yeah well you know See, we we can we can we can certainly hire out some services for you if you need that yeah, just yeah. Uh, just let us know just throwing our names out there and, um, you know well, i was gonna say is there anything you know because obviously I've, I've 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 looked at your your website um oh dear hang on a minute i've got so many browser windows open i've got no idea. i have all your art on my desktop right now all i'm doing is like gagging over it over and over again well like i just wanted to bring it up because i'm going to bring it up because no, i get ahead. easily distracted the beast you did um, I'm trying to find it again. I'm not sure it had to be from Flare Ultra X Men, I believe. Um, I think that was can... actually Mar Marvel Masterpieces. I think. Was it Marvel Masterpieces? Yeah, I found the a picture of the the actual painting, so I can see like all the amazing texture in it. Man, the lighting effect on that and the Professor X, like it's so crisp. Like it's crazy to me. What was some of the technique for that just before we get into other stuff i'm just dying to know personally because you did the same thing for the surfer which is just an amazing background and i don't know if anyone's told you <laughs> he's kind of my favorite um <laughs> but I the think... beast uh no i mean it's great it's a phenomenal piece obviously but the beast has just this beautiful fur texture and everything on it it's just so miraculous well i came up with a technique it's kind of it's kind of funny and a bit ironic um the, I, I was working on this technique the whole the whole year I was working or a year and a half whatever it was for them, and I kind of perfected it as far as I was concerned. The very last card I did, so I got it. Uh, oh, oh, there it is. <laughs> yeah, just in case. Oh yeah, that's uh, that that is good. That did come out good. <laughs> that fur just looks amazing. I mean, look at that, it's just freaking amazing. Yeah. Yeah, and fur just again, like you know, like talking about the uh, Slumdog Millionaire thing. Like I'm sure I had to, you know, do some some crap like uh, illustration of like a, a teddy bear or like a something where, where I learned how to do some some fur techniques that I could return to there. But I had this. I developed this technique for most of the set, um, which again I came up with a much better version of this technique for the last painting I did of Spider Man swinging through like the city. And that was the last painting. So if only I had known that before I did the first painting, but I didn't. But I, I did this thing where I basically, we kind of plot them all out like color by numbers paintings. And I would actually have people help me, like my wife would do it. My, my mom at one point did some. My, a good friend of mine, one of my college roommates from, uh, from uh, SVA, from art school, would, would do it. And they would basically, like, I'd mix the colors and I'd put like a little dot of the colors where I wanted them. And they would like fill in like just flat, color and then i'd go back and and that was just the beginning of it that was like the underpainting kind of and then wow. i'd go back and, and i did it myself for most of them but this is like when i was like at the height of craziness sometimes i'd be in my at my table doing one my 
my wife would be filling in just the flat colors of another one. Um, so that was one thing I came up with. But in the end, the thing I came up with with the Spider-Man one that I wish I'd known earlier was I just did kind of like a really washy, like transparent acrylic painting. And then with my airbrush, I just kind of airbrushed in a lot of detail. And then on top of that, I'd finish, I'd like do all the finishing artwork. So wow. that, so some of them, yeah, some of them I used some airbrush, some of them, um, I used, yeah, that Spider-Man there, there that, yeah, that one, exactly. That's the last one I did. And on that one, so that one I did, I liked it. I think it came out good and it was fast. It was way faster than most of the other ones I did. I love the light from behind. Yeah. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. Yeah, they, they were actually a little oh. bit irritated about that because um, I was originally going to have a helicopter behind him. And then as I was painting it, I realized that the helicopter would just, it would pull focus away. It would just be too, you know, too Smart. distracting. And so I, so I changed it. And then when they got, when they got the painting, they were like, where's the helicopter? And I was like, eh, you don't want the helicopter. It just, and, and they were kind of like, I think they thought I was being lazy or something. And I was like, nah, it, believe me, I, the helicopter just won't. It won't be as good. You'll be looking at the helicopter. So I don't know. I think you're 100 percent right on that. Absolutely, yeah. that light really sh makes sure the focus is on Spidey. Like it's just so clean. I've, I, I've got to ask you because obviously all this, um, a lot of this stuff, if not if not on Google, is on your your website scanthelart.com, oh, so and there's some amazing stuff on there. But when I was looking for earlier on, not the or Abe Sapien on the homepage is extraordinary. But then That's I've seen insanely I, beautiful. I, I saw this picture, which has just quite frankly blown my mind. <laughs> um, for, uh, literally, can you can you tell us wh where did this come from? What 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 was, what was this produced for? Uh, that was an illustration I did for a book cover for, uh, and that's one that again, that's one of the ones I never got back again. That's one that somebody you know was eaten by time. I think that's yeah, yeah, I definitely don't have it. I think someone took that one. Um, but yeah, that was a book called Mind Swap. I think it was. Yeah. Uh -huh. I had I had this. Yeah, it's funny because that was kind of me ish at the time. That's kind of my father, who's the green guy who didn't have a nose like that, but I, and that's kind of my dog at the time in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of, <laughs> And that's like thing a family right... photo album. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that, that thing on the insectile creature on the right, I made out of clay and I took one of my mother's earrings and used it for the nose ring. So she wasn't too pleased about that. But uh, yeah, oh. so, but yeah, and that was a, there was a company like when I was in art school and then just at art school, um, there was a book publishing company who I did a lot of work for and they went out of business. Um, and stiffed me for a bunch of money, which unfortunately was the kind of stuff that happens to a lot of uh, young artists. But on the upside, I did a whole bunch of samples. So it really kind of helped me fill out my first kind of version of my portfolio. So that was helpful. Wow. And yeah, I got paid I, some of them. I got stiffed on all of them. I love that. When I was Googling, actually, I did see a link of it come up with an overlay that said um, some sort of auction site. So I think the original painting has been sold and resold. Oh, that one, I think, yeah, I think actually I, I probably sold that one to somebody. That one, ah, I, okay. I, I think because I also went to a couple of conventions early earlier, and I remember a couple of the conventions I sold some of the um, book covers I was doing. So yeah, I probably did sell uh, that. Yeah, I don't yeah, want to his reputation there. Yeah, it's on comic art fans. Like someone, someone's very much in love with it. <laughs> they I were like never for I sale. Did. So I <laughs> I yeah, no, I think that one actually just to just to clear that up, I think that one actually I did sell. And then yeah, I don't want someone uh, to think they they have contraband there. No, <laughs> you just increase the value, sir. So, <laughs> so outside of the um, uh, graphic novel that you mentioned you're working on, is there anything you want you kind of want to pimp? You know, have you got anything else coming up that, or should we just keep our ears open for your graphic novel? No, I would say just, just um, I'm going to start to to put a lot more stuff about that on uh, my Instagram site, uh, my Instagram page, or what, what do you call Instagram? Your Instagram uh, uh, page, Instagram. feed, page. feed. There we go, feed. <laughs> Whatever the heck it is, yeah, and and that, that that's pretty much what I'm working on. I'm I'm spending, especially now, now that I'm you know I work too, but I have so much more time as everyone does, being being a bit of a shut in, which which I feel terrible saying this. I mean, I, obviously, I'm totally against the the virus, and and uh, obviously, so many people legitimately are suffering terribly, which is awful. Um, but you know, for for people of you know of a creative mindset, being shut into your studio is not really a new thing, and so. You know that part of it at least has a redeeming. I shouldn't even have said that. It's a terrible. It's it's a terrible... no. It's no no no. I think I think it's there. I mean, my wife and I are the same way. Like we're both writers, so we're both kind of like we've noticed the difference. And I, I yeah, it feels terrible, but 
you know, we haven't really noticed the difference. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because we have, Perfect. we do spend so much time yeah. creatively, you know, doing work and producing work that it's, you know, it's less. It's, it's yeah. 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 Unless it unless it affects someone you you love, which obviously is always the danger. So, yes. I mean, yeah. the the interesting thing about it is is that it is forcing on pretty much every uh, section of society change to how we how we how we operate as a as a as a society and how we operate as a species um you know certainly here where we live everyone's saying that there's so much less pollution you can hear bird song you've got a lot more wild birds and animals coming into the more uh, urban areas of the city um and that's just the stuff we can see you know so wow. it is you know there's a lot of um thinking uh so i don't want to go on too much of a tangent on current events but it, it is the sort of thing you can't ignore because everyone's experiencing it um speaking of shared national experiences as we were earlier um is that there will be some lasting change hopefully from this you know people are saying that you know off the back of it you know will things be greener will people work from home more you know yeah. so it's it's i find it fascinating i mean it's terrifying to be in the middle of and it's you know i'm yes. furloughed from my from my from my job so you know it's a it's a, it's a tricky time and a worrying time but uh but I'm, you know i'm glad there's an upside to it i guess is what i'm trying to say you know there's the upside to it is that you do get the time to say okay i i can't put that off anymore there's no reason for me to put that off anymore let's just let's just do that or let's explore this and i guess it gives you a bit more creative thinking time possibly i don't know yeah, you know absolutely yeah yeah, yeah, yeah you do, all we can hope for is that there are some good things come of it. I mean, you know, you can pretty much count on there will be people opportunistically making bad things come of it, which yeah. fortunately is kind of the history of humanity. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, but yeah. we can be hopeful that, you know, that, that some good things will come of it too, hopefully. Yeah, well, you know, we, got to, we got to spend uh, a, a few hours of Sunday with you. so Which is <laughs> crazy, just insane, just amazing. Very enjoyable. So, really you know, it. so thank you, uh, Peter. For is it? Do you prefer Peter or Pete? Either one. Either one. Usually, like my, my good friends call me Pete, uh, but yeah. uh, which you feel free to do. Uh, you know, either way. That's okay. Whatever. Usually, when I can't remember someone's name on the podcast, I call them Steve. But we'll never forget your name. So, <laughs> we'll never. Um, I won't your start name. doing that. I won't start doing that. But Peter Scanlon, thank you very much. Um, this has been so absolutely. Much fantastic uh what we, what we always do is we'll put all the pictures that we've and all the pictures all the paintings and pieces of art that we've talked about we'll put them on our tasting notes and some of them will go on instagram and, and twitter but most of them will be on the facebook group uh we'll, we'll put a link to your website of course and yeah and this just, you know yeah if you feel comfortable this might also be a video like an internet video and we'll put the yeah. art on yeah it's totally only if you feel comfortable and i shower you know, i'm good yeah, <laughs> you're looking good, <laughs> brother. <laughs> then, ev then everyone can see your plague beard. <laughs> as, as long as I would like, but I already described that. Uh, my wife. Yeah. It is it is good. Um, so at the end of our episodes, we we have a um, uh, our sign off is enjoy collecting. Um, so we would be absolutely honoured if you would if you would take us out at the end of this episode. All right, enjoy collecting. Marvelous. Amazing. Nailed it. Nailed it Yay. first time. There we go. <laughs> you on a bouncy chair? Well, you on a chair that bounces? I'm on a, actually look at this. This is what I sit on now. I'm on a ball. Oh, okay. there we go. Are yeah. Nice cuz I hate my chair, so I'm thinking of like what the heck? That's really good, man. I can't do that shit. Oh. <laughs> Was it called hospital? Yeah, people